is of course we may to start. Um, very pleased to welcome you all here today to one of our aspects of exile uh, talks, which have been given within the um, parameters of the uh, Insider Outsider Festival. And there's a bit of paper like this, which I haven't, if I haven't given it to you, do pick it up. It gives you a list of all the talks. And today I'm welcoming Brea Lefkowitz, Dr. Brea Lefkowitz, who will be talking about, and soon the train will go to the station, and the long journey to England began, the experience of the kinder transport and oral history testimonies. Now a few words about, about Brea Lefkowitz. She's a social anthropologist and oral historian, and she's a director of the AJR Refugee Voices Testimony Archive. And she's a member of the Research Centre for German and Austrian Exile Studies, which has its base here. And her research interests include oral history, trauma and memory, diasporas and displacement, nationalism and ethnicity. And she's worked on quite a large number of oral history projects. And also has directed and produced a wide range of testimony films. Um, she, uh, she's curated several exhibitions, which some of you may remember, Continental Britons, Double Exposure, Safari Voices, and most recently, Still in Our Hands, Kinder Life Portraits. And she has quite a number of publications as well. So, very yes. we're glad to have you here, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you very much. Um, yes, you could see your head. The title's actually slightly different. We were thrown right by the Tides of History. Um, because the PowerPoint didn't say it, but anyway, I'll come back to, to that quote. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this evening lecture. Um, I'll focus on the experience of, kinder, of the kinder transport in oral histories. I'm very pleased to be presenting my research within the year-long Insider Outsider Festival, but should say that my focus today will not be on the contribution of the kinder transportees to British culture, and neither will I focus on the more known kinder, such as Lord Dubs or Dame Stephanie Shirley, who uh, delivered the Miller Memorial Lecture here in 2015 at the Research Center for German Austrian Exile Studies. What I would like to do here tonight is to present you the work of the AJR Refugee Voices Archive and reflect on the long-lasting impact of the experience of the kinder transport on the lives of the kinder, documented in the interviews. I recently um, conducted an interview with the Guardian journalist Hella Pick um, who came from Vienna as a 10-year-old on the kinder transport. Uh, some of you might have seen, I made a little film, and it's actually on our website, HR Refugee Voices, if you want to see the film, please go to the website. Um, at the end of her interview, and the beginning of the film, she says, quote, I'm totally convinced that the fact of having been uprooted has left a lasting impact and creates a certain degree of insecurity which never leaves you. The topic uh, of the lasting impact is what I'd like to explore here tonight with you. I'm going to try and look at a selected number of interviews and ask uh, how the impact of the kinder transport experience is present in the oral history interviews as perceived by the interviewers, i.e. in direct answer to the interviewer's question, but also in other ways. Trauma can also be present in the general narrative of the interview. Uh, for example, the, the past can often come uh, intruding into the present, so the chronology is dis disrupted. There can be a sense of disjointedness and disorder, a repetition of themes, etc. Uh, but this also could be expressed in the repression of memory or the inability to remember. And of course in the actual interview, which then can consist of the inability to create a relationship between the interviewee and the interviewer. It doesn't happen often, but sometimes it does happen that no matter what you do, it, you cannot create a, a relationship. Uh, and sometimes, again, a few times, I have experienced, and maybe told you as well, I don't know, uh, some sort of hostility uh, of the interviewee that you're actually there to interview the person. Um, that happens as well. Reading the literature on trauma and the Holocaust, we know that often the trauma lies in the non-speakability, the negation of narrative, the reluctance to remember, um, and as I said before, the intrusion of the past into the present. While interviews by nature do create a narrative, I would argue that we can find traces of trauma in many kinder transport interviews, even if not, even if not explicit in the narratives. 
I tried to make that point in my previous paper on the AGR Kindertrotz interviews when I said, quote, that while only a few interviews describe the anxiety and insecurities, the negative reflection are present in silences and short comments. The long-lasting effect of the traumatic experience of the Kindertransport is often apparent when the interviewee had to be convinced to be interviewed by a family member and is reluctant to be interviewed. I interviewed a woman last year who had come on the Kindertransport to the UK from Bochum. Throughout the interview, she repeated, I can't remember, so sorry, I can't remember, or I don't remember. And I did a word count that appeared about 20 times throughout the interview. She had an arrangement to go somewhere and she was very keen to finish the interview. The minute we got there, I should also say we, she didn't want to be interviewed in her, in her own house, so it had to be somewhere else as well. So the location uh, was also problematic for her. She said that she had a happy life and that she never dwelled on the past. Not to my surprise, I received a phone call the next day to say she was very unhappy about something she said about her grandchild and this caused her great anxiety. So we had the problem what to do with it and in the end we, we cut it out for her version so uh, that she was happy with the interview and I'm not even sure she was happy with the interview then. Other times one feels that the interviewee is relieved to have finished the interview uh, as if the interview was a sort of obligation which had to be fulfilled. One interviewer came to me and said I'm so happy that we've done it now I never have to tell my story ever again. Not sure that's true but that's, that's what she said to me. So the very first interview we conducted for Refugee Voices um, um, was with a kid in 2003, in January 2003, with Marion Lesser, who was born in 1925 in Berlin. She had arrived in 19, July 1939 and in 1943 joined the Land Army. I clearly remember this interview because it was a difficult interview. Um, throughout the interview her answers were short, she got more upset that the longer we interviewed her and she wanted to finish as soon as possible. And I should say what's interesting is that one actually remembers the difficult interviews and this was some time ago but I have a very distinct memory about it um, because you know it was, it was difficult and she really didn't want to talk. Um, when I asked her if she would attended the first kinder transport reunion organized by Bertha Leverton uh, she answered, quote, it was interesting, yes, I intended it was interesting, but I believe in letting sleeping dogs lie. Don't try and unravel it all and start all over again. End of quote. And here lies the challenge for any interviewer. While the aim of an interview is to unravel the person's past, the interviewer, of course, does not want to inflict pain on the interviewee. So it is not surprising that very soon after Marion Lesser made her statement uh, and, and started crying, I finished the interview. So even if trauma or lasting impact is not explicitly discussed in the interview, the interview itself and the narrative it produces can be a testament to that very trauma. And I, I read the transcript today of Marinessa that I wanted to see whether it is actually apparent in the, in the, in the transcript. And it's more apparent in the video, because I watched it as well, and there you can really see how uncomfortable she is uh, and what happened. She was recommended, she was a active AGR volunteer, she had an interesting story, but she really didn't want to, to do it, but here we are. So that was our first interview. So today I will focus on a sample of 10 interviews which have been conducted as part of, the, of our archive, and they all feature in the exhibition I recently curated called Still in Our Hands, which was displayed recently in Lancaster House. But before discussing the 10 interviews, let me just briefly say something about the AGR Refugee Voices testimony to contextualize the interviews. Um, and I'm very happy to say that we have now a website, so I'm going to pre keep this bit very short because you can all go to the website refugeevoices.co.uk or agrrefugeevoices.org.uk and you'll find all the information um, there. Uh, so this, if you go to, we have a map page and you can go, you can see what people came from and where we interviewed them. Um, in the first phase of the project, uh, which I co-directed with Dr. Anthony Granville, uh, we conducted 150 interviews, and then the project was started again, and is still ongoing, and we have up to date, and actually not 80, we have done 85 interviews. Um, so that's um, the situation today. Um, here just a little bit about the length of the interview, uh, the, the, um, 
we interviewed survivors and refugees, we didn't select people, uh, it wasn't dependent on the experience, everyone who wanted to be interviewed was interviewed, uh, the style is a general oral history interview, open questions, it was important for us to, for people to have time to reflect, uh, to give them space at the end of the interview to reflect on their experiences, uh, we didn't have set questions, um, then it, a refugee voice is also a photo, a photo and document archive. At the end of each interview, we, um, we film photographs and documents. Um, and very importantly, at the end of everything, we create biographical details and we send interviews to the families and the interviews have the families. Uh, and the style is a head and shoulder shot. We don't zoom in, it's a steady shot. Uh, and at the end, sometimes people also read letters or family members appear. Um, so if you go, you can search the website in different ways. You can look for place of birth, for example. Here are all the places of birth which we have in the archive. I don't know whether you can read them. But uh, not surprisingly, the biggest number of interviews is from Berlin and Vienna, um, followed by, by other places. Um, so here just a little presentation, who are the oldest interviews, I, I won't talk about it now. The oldest one is Carl Flesch, born in 1910. So it's a wonderful idea that we managed to capture somebody who was born in 1910. Uh, and followed by Klaus Hinrich in 1912, uh, Arya Handler, anyway, I won't talk about it now. Uh, and here are just the youngest interviewees. Eva Clark, Tom Key, Francis Robertson, uh, those are people, Eva Clark, born in Mauthausen concentration camp two weeks before the end of the war. Quite incredible story how her mother was pregnant in Mauthausen and she was just born at the time where she had a chance to survive because uh, she was liberated literally three weeks after her birth. Um, Francoise Robertson, she was in hiding in Belgium, Tom Key, the middle of Hungarian survivors. So here are the youngest. Interviews. Now, kinder transport. If you go to our website and you type in interviews kinder transport, around 63 people show up. And I say around because it's not quite clear. In some cases, it's quite clear you were in the kinder transport. In some others, it's not quite clear. Maybe you were put on a train with a relative, uh, but then received some help. So, was it a kinder transport? Was it not a kinder transport? So, depending on how you count, but it, the number is quite large. It's about 63, 64. And here I made a list of all the people uh, in, the two, in the two different phases of our project. So we, are, we have about 35 people interviewed between 2003 and 2008. And in the last phase, we, I think we're, we're getting there, or almost, almost 30 people. Um, yeah. So here is the age representation of the kinder. Um, so the oldest kinder uh, were born in 1922, which is which are these three people, Francis Stein and the middle root Sellers and Walter Brunner. Um, and one of the ladies I'm going to talk about today was born in 1923, Eve Jill from Vienna. The youngest kinder were born in 1925, 34, 33. Uh, you know, might know some of them, this is Sir A. Reich. Uh, Eve Willman, I'm going to talk about the Ruth Barnett um, and Hannah Würzburger. That is the range of the entire Kinder collection. So this age representation reminds us that while we talk about the Kinder transport, we actually talk about the wide variety of experiences shaped by age and individual circumstances of each interviewee. On the lower age range, the children became British school children. On the upper age range, children often could not complete their education, were expected to carry out domestic duties, uh, were sometimes subject to internment. About a thousand kinder were later interned, um, and some of them joined the Pioneer Corps or the Lance Army, as mentioned before. Some kinder were joined by their parents before the outbreak of World War II. Um, Often they couldn't live with the parents because the parents had domestic uh, permits and had to be in domestic service. So they couldn't take the children with them. Some children were reunited with the parents uh, and some children never saw their parents again. The percentage of this is disputed. There are no clear numbers as we recently heard at the conference. Um, according to an AJR survey, which was carried out some time ago, 
60% um, of the children did reunite with one surviving parent. So it's an interesting statistic, more than it was thought of. But we will not, there, there's no way of proving it, so it could be 50 or 60%, but we definitely know 40% were not reunited. Um, fine. So, the 10 people featured in my exhibition are a random selection of our 64, 63 to 64 kinder transport interviews. Now, what do they have in common? They were all interviewed by me. Um, the interviews took place between 2015 and 2018, so they are the last interviews. They're not from the first group. Um, and I managed to take still photographs with the interviewers holding a photo of themselves pre-emigration at the end of the interviews, hence the selection the, the interviews I did because I, I'm the person with the camera who takes uh, those sort of photos. But more importantly, what do they have in common in terms of their kinder transport experience? And so let me just briefly go through it. First of all, they represent the age of the kinder transportees. The youngest was five years old when she traveled, who is Eve Wilman, here in the middle. Um, and the oldest were Walter Kammerling and Eve Jill. So Walter Kammerling is here and Eve Jill is here. Um, six came from Vienna, two from Berlin, one from Gotha, and one from Halle an der Saale. Nine came to Britain, and one interview, Eve Kugler, who is here, Eve Kugler, uh, was sent with a group of children to the USA in 1940, when visas were made available uh, for unaccompanied children to escape unoccupied France, and she sailed from Portugal to America. Um, then two interviewees, Walter Kammerling and Otto Hatter, so here's Otto Hatter and Walter Kammerling, um, came on the first kinder transport from Vienna in December 1938. One interview, Hannah Wurzelberger, came on the last, where's Hannah? Here. She came on the last kinder transport from Berlin, which left on the 1st of September 1939. I checked that date because I didn't quite believe it, but it's true. It really left on the 1st of September 1939. Um, and one interviewee came on the last kinder transport from Holland in May 1940. And this is Robert Harry Jacobi, who recently passed away. Um, and he's got a very interesting story um, because he, he came on that last kinder transport from Holland in May 1940. And he is connected which I found out when I did research about the 10 people. So the story, he is connected to the story of Otto and Walter, because they came on the first kinder transport, he came on the last kinder transport from Holland. But they are connected uh, through one woman, and the name of the woman is Gertrud Trus Weissmüller, who was talked about in uh, the, last, the last conference, uh, the Kinder Transport Forum, because she organized the first kinder transport from Vienna, and she also, so what happened, uh, she had a meeting with Eichmann, and Eichmann agreed that 600 children could leave Vienna in the next days, which she managed to organize, which was a major achievement. Out of the 600 children, 500 came to England, uh, I think they all came to Dover Court, and 100 children were sent to Holland, and they were put in an orphanage. So they went at orphanage, and when the German um, came to occupy Holland, she managed that 60 and found a boat and buses and arranged that 66 children uh, could literally just escape and make that boat and sail to England. And it was the 66 children plus other families who joined the boat. Um, she went on the boat, but then left. She left a handbag on the boat and went back. She stayed in Holland, but the children survived. So I think it's quite interesting um, that. This, the ten people, the three people are sort of linked um, really to, to her rescue efforts and there's a film being made about her at the moment because she's not that well, so not well known, certainly not in England. Um, so, and two interviews came on the same transfer from Vienna in March 39. Freddie Kosten, who is over here, um, and <coughs> Eve, Jill, here, they came on the same transport. In the sample of the 10 interviews, two interviewees, Liesel Grünberger and Freddy Kosten, this is Liesel and Freddy, um, had parents or one parent in the UK before the outbreak of war. Um, Liesel joined her mother in the UK, who was already working as a domestic, and Freddy Kosten's parents were brought out by the people he stayed with. 
So that's another category that somebody managed to get a place and the people he was staying with got the parents out. I don't think there are that many cases. <coughs> um, he had an interesting story because he was taken in by quite a glamorous couple, um, the playwright Ben Levy and the Hollywood actress Constant Cummings. Don't know whether anyone knows her. Um, and they lived in a house designed, the only private house designed by Walter Gropius in Chelsea. Um, so he had quite a glamorous arrival. He was picked up by Bentley and was driven to that house in Chelsea. Um, and you know, was sent to was sent to school there. And yeah, most interestingly, they, they helped to get the parents out and the parents, uh, the mother, the father was in turn, the mother stayed in the same house and wasn't expected to do any domestic duties and lived there um, as a guest. You know, so it's, that's quite an amazing story. Anyway, two interviewees were reunited with the parents after the war. And this is Eve Jill, whose parents survived the war in Shanghai and managed to come to Britain after the war. And Eve Kugler's parents uh, managed to join her in, in America. The other six interviews did not meet their parents again. The most striking similarity in terms of the lives of these ten kinder is the frequent movement of the kinder in their early years of post-immigration in between foster families, hostels, farms, educational camps, schools, and boarding schools. When listening to the stories, it becomes apparent how complex the process of settling was, and that the children were often exposed to random decisions by various agencies, sometimes in conflict with other family members. Um, so we have situations where, for example, if Wilma, she had an uncle, uh, who was not happy where she was placed, and she wanted to stay, so it wasn't clear who was making the decision about uh, where she should stay, and I'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, so good, two good examples for this, where there, were, there was conflict and people moved around, are uh, Hannah Würzburger and Eve Willman. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Hannah Würzburger. When Hannah aged five, and I should say, of course, they're both from the younger age spectrum, and that's really important for their story. When Hannah aged five, and here she is, um, arrived on the last kinder transport from Berlin in September 1939. Uh, she vaguely recalls saying goodbye to her parents, but does not recall the trip. Soon she was sent to a Jewish children's home in Hemel Hempstead called Shalom House. Hannah describes that she was not happy in the home, it was very strict, and that nobody expected one young woman took an interest in her. She took comfort from the dog who lived in the house, and she describes in detail they had to do a lot of domestic chores, um, and really they were quite neglected, they were not, the food wasn't good, um, nobody really took care of them. The children were also punished for their misbehaved, and as I said, they had to do many chores. When Hannah was older, friends of her aunt gave her paper and envelopes and advised her to keep it in school so that she could write freely to, free to them, as the letters from her the home were read. So they were censored, so she was quite aware that she couldn't send anything from the home. Uh, but from the school she was able to send letters. Uh, interesting story. Um, after it became clear that she was not happy, it was arranged that Hannah went to Stoke Rough Boarding School in Hazelmere, Surrey. The school was led by three German Jewish women and many of the pupils were from a refugee background. Hannah described that she felt, quote, she had landed and that she was among people who were interested in her. Um, but this is only after she arrived six, I think she had six years in that in Shalom House, so it's, it's a rather long time. And this is how Hannah describes her journey. Um, so what's interesting, I was you know, looking at the journey um, as an example of the kind of narrative, you know, what, how do people remember, and I think the journey is quite a good example in seeing how people remember. Um, so you can see, we talked about, do you remember the journey? I said, I don't, I seem to have a picture, whether it's made up or not, of being with lots of children, the train, I think I'd actually a teddy bear, my parents, my mother, I think on the station. Uh, I don't know how they let me get there or anything, but I mean, it may be imaginary thing. I don't know. I think what you think you remember is probably more important than what, you act, what actually happened. So I don't remember anything of the journey or, or the other end coming here. As I say, I had an aunt over here, and so I lived in the same house that she was a domestic in, because this was, <coughs> they allowed so many in but they were just mostly doing domestic work. <clears throat> and you can see here, it's quite fragmented. You know, the, this is a transcript of her actual speech. 
So it's not in whole sentences. She's struggling um, with the memory, um, and and um, she in the later part of the interview she talks about the difficulties and the impact of her displacement and separation from family. She says, "Well, the fact that." I didn't have a family, a near, a close-by family, right, of my own, to support me. That would probably, I mean, you need that. Even if they're not always the best, whatever, you know where you belong. So she's quite aware of the impact the killer transport had on herself. And I think in the narrative you could see how she's struggling with the memory and the words. Um, yeah, so the other young person in my sample of 10 interviews is Eve Wilman. She, aged six, arrived together with an older girl, a friend of the family, in April 1939 from Vienna. To a great distress, she was separated from, uh, from the girl and fostered by a Unitarian minister and his wife, who was very strict. And now let us look at the, the, the narrative again. <clears throat> so I say, what are your first memories, actually? Where, wherever they are, and what are they? And she says, well, I think it must have been, you know, after I came to England when I went to live with the first family. Because I remember the, I don't remember much about him, but she was very strict. You know, she hadn't had any children. And I remember she made me make the beds with, you know, proper corners. You know, like they used to do in hospitals. And everything was sort of, sort of austere. I must, I must have felt the contrast, although, you know, I couldn't remember what I had. But I, you know, I knew that the present wasn't so good. And I think that's a very powerful statement, you know. She says, I couldn't remember what I had, but I know what I had wasn't good. And I think that must have been the experience of many of the young, young um, kinder. So, uh, when, the, when he lost his job, Eve needed to move on, and the refugee committee found a family in Cambridge, where Eve was very happy. And this comes back to what I alluded before. Her uncle, who was a rabbi, was not very happy with her placement, partly due to the lack of Jewish instruction or Jewishness. And she had to move again to another family. When the refugee committee discovered that Eve was doing too much housework, she was moved to a school in Berkhamstead. Her uncle, who lived with his family in West Hartlepool, wanted Eve to join them, but the refugee committee did not think that was in her best interest. So that's also interesting. There was family member, but they were relatively poor, they were refugees. So the refugee committee decided it is not the right time to go there. After some time, Eve was allowed to visit her uncle and eventually was allowed to live with them. And that's how Eve describes it. She says, it all turned out. That's why, you know, after, when I went to live with my uncle at 11, I just felt like a normal child again. But again, 11, she arrived as a six-year-old. Um, the two interviews with the younger children, kinder children, demonstrate that the lack of clear memories, which in the interviews translate to lack of narrative, is something the kinder had to come to terms with. This contrasts to the situation of the older children, who had more memories, um, yet sometimes this is not necessarily reflected in the narrative of the interview because of the traumatic nature of the memories. So you would expect that somebody who's older has more memories, and that's true for some interviews, but some interviews who are older still don't have the memories, which is interesting. So Diana Davis was 13 when she came, but she, and here's Diana Davis, where is she? She's here, the lady on the left. Um, and she was 13, but she repeats throughout the interview, quote, I wanted to forget. You know, a lot of me just didn't want to remember. It was horrible. Um, Hela Pick, who I mentioned before, was 10 when she came. And, really interestingly, she cannot remember anything from Vietnam. In 10 years, you know, we interview some people who can remember a lot as a 10 year old. She has no memories. When I interviewed her, she said she arrived in England in April 1939. But when we, she agreed, she had never looked at her document at World Jewish Relief. So I asked her if she was interested to go. She said, okay. I arranged the visit. We took her to World Jewish Relief. Um, and to her surprise, it shows that she came in March 1939, which she didn't know about it. And not only that, that it said the date, there was a long file on her and her mother, who was a domestic. And she found out a lot of things. 
Um, and it showed that she was in regular contact with the refugee children movement because there was a big issue about her education. She was sponsored by a family uh, and the family wanted her to stop schooling. And I think that applies to many other kinder. Um, but because her mother was there, her mother disagreed. Her mother wanted her to continue schooling. So there was a sort of argument and it turned out that the children's movement had actually supported her to go to, to a prep school. Um, and continued to support her and eventually she studied at the London School of Economics and she was in touch, there was a big fire uh, there and she had no recollection of that either, she couldn't remember that she saw people from Bloomsbury How she couldn't remember that, so it's quite interesting, now she's writing a book about it, so I um, hope that will, should be interesting. Um, the older children in my sample often prefer to live in hostels or boarding houses than stay with the family or became a part of an educational agricultural community such as the farm in Melaya in Northern Ireland where Walter Kamerling was sent to or Habunim camps which were secular Zionist Jewish camps in Exmouth in Wales where Diana Davis um, here uh, spent some more years. The oldest girl in my sample of 10 interviews was Eve Jill who was born 1923 in Vienna. You can see her here, and she was already older. You can see that's a picture when she came, she was older. Um, and in her interview, she has a wonderful, uh, actually, she has a wonderful diary um, where she keeps records when she came, but which the first entry is uh, uh, in the diary, I think, is a letter from her aunt, and it's really very, very moving. I can't go into it now, but yeah. So, uh, she had to face a common problem, which was that she was expected to be a domestic helper rather than a member of the family. She was on the older age spectrum. So she came as a kid, but then wasn't treated as a kid. In March, <coughs> March 1939, Eve travelled by train on a kinder transport to Britain. At Liverpool Street Station, she was met by a Mr. Levin, a Jewish man from Glasgow. They travelled to Glasgow and she joined the family as an au pair. She was used as a maid, had to sleep in the kitchen, and did not receive a lot of food or emotional support. She felt very isolated and lonely in this family, and who had to work very hard. When she moved to another family, and this is a really interesting story, the Levines refused to give her her belongings, which consisted of one suitcase. And Mrs. Levine wrote a, a letter to the Home Office to complain that the girl she took in had decided to leave. Uh, but eventually she, she managed to get that suitcase. Eve stayed with an, a few other families until she ended up with Mr. and Mrs. Lockhead, who took her in and gave her love and affection. She stayed in touch with them her whole life. So her interview is very different in nature. It's very detailed and she also reflects on her own emotion. And here, I, we, we can't read this now, but what I want to show you here is how long the narrative is without any interruption. And it's very, very different from the interviews with the younger people, where you can see they need many more questions. So because I only ask questions if the person stops, otherwise I'm not asking. So you can see here, and it's really interesting because she tells, um, she gives the context very well of the kinder transport, and she explains here that she actually organized a visa she, uh, for her, uh, or a ticket, to, for her father to Shanghai as a 15 year old. So she has an understanding, of course, with a five year old child can't have. So she was almost an adult in Vienna, and that creates this sort of narrative. Um, and we've done now a few other interviews where you can have that. Um, there was a, a man who just passed away, it's called Harry Biebring. Tony totally might know him. Uh, he goes, you know, he's very famous, he went to many, many schools, and his narrative. I just read the interview and the detail of it is just, just amazing. And even to detail which we don't find in many testimonies. I mean, the, the detail of the memory and what he describes. Um, but here again, you can see this long, long stretch of narrative. Um, so at a later stage of the, um, at a later stage in the interview, we return to the topic of the journey and I ask her what the hardest part was and she says, Getting to Holland, getting to, well, leaving, first of all, which is obviously, it's difficult sometimes because there are times when I speak in public and it gets to me. And I find it's difficult to go past the goodbyes. 
And other times, just like now, I managed to sort of just talk about it. The goodbye, and I said, the goodbye is the hard part. Of course, the last time you see your mother standing on a platform, I've often wondered in my older life how they did it, how the mothers did it. Because not one of them knew that you're actually going or if they would ever see you again. And again, this is interesting because she is somebody who goes, she's not actually affiliated with the HR, she lives in South London, but she, in her right old age, goes to schools and has become a, a speaker. So in the interview, she can reflect about that as well, so, which is, is interesting. Um, so it would be actually interesting, when I, I, I was reading this, to do some research where we compare narratives of interviewees who speak in schools and narrative interviewees who don't speak in school. Because I'm sure there is a difference whether somebody has talks about it a lot or somebody doesn't. So let me come back to the question of trauma in the interviews and how the interviews themselves perceive of the long-lasting effect of the kinder transport. The questions in the interview which address these issues are along the lines of questions. What impact did your experience of the kinder transport have on your life? How has it affected you? How do you think your life would have been if you had not been forced to emigrate? Is there anything you miss from Vienna, Berlin? In our interviews since 2015, we made a conscious effort to follow up also on mental health questions and gender issues. The mental health question is delicate and we can only ask it if it's appropriate, uh, mostly when the interview themselves explicitly talks about mental health. But I, we have a feeling it's sort of changed. So 10 years ago, you couldn't talk about it, but now some interviewees are happy to talk about it. Um, so if technology works, I want to just, if we have time, play you a few clips uh, on this question of impact, if the technology. So here's Eve Bowman. Let's see what she has to say.
I was in hospital having my daughter when he died, so yes. And how different do you think the life would have been if you had a good culture or a Oh, I think it would be much worse. Much worse. I think the opportunities would have been much worse. And I don't know. I have often thought what would have happened to me in Vienna. And I never liked that prospect. Yeah. No. Why? What do you think would have happened? I have no idea which way it is. But I, 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 uh, I don't know what kind of job I would have gotten. No, I, I'm afraid I, I fell on my feet, and that is one of the reasons, uh, and I've been so extraordinarily lucky, and that is one of the reasons why, if anything, I, I suffer from uh, uh, the, the guilt of the survivor, you, you know, death. The other thing, this path of your life. Um, there are many, many other opportunities uh, that I've managed with luck uh, to have. So it's, uh, it's totally molded me in uh, this peculiar direction of mining geology, which was a pure uh, shot in the dark, so to speak. Um, I think our, my life in particular, I'm not sure about all our lives, seems to be punctuated by tragedies that turned into uh, good luck in a variety of ways. So, I think it's striking that both men, Otto Hutter and Freddie Costin, point to the opportunities they had. Uh, and the women talk about the emotional impact on their families. Of course, Hatta actually also speaks about the family, to, to be fair. Um, and Eve Willman had a distinguished career as a research biochemist. Um, the fact that Otto Hatta talks about his parents and sister who did not survive points to the different experience of the kinder transplantees who lost their parents and the kinder transplantees whose parents could join them. While Eve Willman clearly describes the strong impact of the kinder transport on her, in this clip, throughout the interview, her narrative is very accepting. When asked if she was upset with the refugee committee for not allowing her to move in with her uncle, she points out that it turned out well in the end. At another point, she says, it's very interesting with children. They adapt in some ways, don't they? But I think children, in some ways, they're quite trusting. And, you know, it happened. You know, I can't do anything about it. End of quote. This narrative of resilience and coping expressed by Eve can be found in many other interviews. While Diana Davis excerpt here, which you heard, acknowledges the impact, she's also fast to point out, but I haven't done badly, did I? I survived, didn't I? In the interview, trauma can be found in different ways, in many ways. She frequently says, I've never told the story, and it emerges that not many of her friends know that she came on the kinder transport. She was not sure that she wanted to be interviewed, and one could feel her reluctance throughout the interview. When she talks about her brother, who contracted TB, 
when he came to Britain, and she thinks maybe because he stayed in a hostel, um, and he spent the years until his death in hospital, she becomes very emotional. In her interview, her narrative is more fragmented, and we can feel that she is not used to telling her story. Um, for example, this is what he answers um, when asked about her luggage on the journey. She says, I took a trunk of clothes, I know that. And I also remember my mother gave me, this is the most extraordinary story, and I've never mentioned this to anyone, my mother gave me a locket with her probably her picture in it. I don't know. Anyway, I got very close to an English girl, the English Jewish girl, and we were great friends, and she was going to America with her mother and her brother. This is during the war. And I gave her that locket. How? Why? I was so fond of her. I think she was sort of replacing my family. And I never told anyone that. But I remember this gold locket, giving it to Jane. Isn't that curious, the memories you have, that you don't know you have them. They just come back. Um, the way she tells it is interesting. It's quite sort of detached. And when I ask her, if the next question is, do you regret giving this locket away? She says, oh, I've got other jewelry. I just regret because my mother gave it to me. Actually, my aunt did give me some other pieces and so forth. So it's interesting because you sort of almost expect something and it's, it doesn't come. You know, she sort of has this detachment. Um, while her message at the end of the interview is quite positive, as we heard, I was lucky, the short answers throughout the interview and the sense of detachment present, she presents tell me a different story. Um, the only um, interview, there is one interview among the ten who talks in greater detail about the, um, the effect of the kinder transport on her mental health and the time in mental health hospital. But I, I won't go into this now. At the time of the 18th anniversary, when the kinder transport has been celebrated as a great British rescue effort, I think it's of particular importance that we need to understand the lasting impact of forced migration of unaccompanied minors properly. Despite the narratives of resilience, coping and empowerment, traces of rupture, trauma and lack of agency can be found in many interviews. Sometimes not, not expressed in the content of the narrative, but the narrative itself. And following this presentation, I, I, I am looking for more time to look at the correlation between trauma and the details of the narrative, or the, you know, the, the sort of disjointed narrative um, and the increase of trauma. So that's something I, I'm interested in. The children were thrown around by the tides of history, and this is recorded by Richard Grunberger, who I interviewed uh, for my first, the first Continental, um, Continental Britain's film, which we co-curated with Tony Grenville. So the children were thrown around by the tides of history, as their fate was in the hands of so many agencies, which different agendas and without proper super supervision which partly resulted in the frequent movement of children in the early years after the arrival, as we've seen here in my small sample of interviewees. As an interviewer, I feel that it has become easier, as I said, to talk about the difficult themes, and that the interviewees are more willing to discuss these topics. It is timely that the German government has acknowledged the suffering of the kinder and is paying now one of payment uh, of 2,500 euros um, to the children. It seems that we are now moving away from the kinder, from regarding the kinder as the lucky ones. The story is more complex. I also hope that the interviews with the kinder in the Refugee Voices Archive will contribute to two areas which have been highlighted as needing more research in the recent kinder transport conferences. A is the fate of the parents, and of course we have lots of correspondence and letters in, in the interviews, so I think if somebody wants to do research, it's, it's there. And B, another topic which came up is the, um, the agency of the children themselves. What, and this is obviously for the older children. What did the older children do? Um, and as you could see here with Eve Jill, who was queuing in an embassy, there is, there is quite a lot of material in there. For example, Richard Grunberger, he describes how he managed. He heard the kinder transport is going. Another interview with Daisy Hoffner, who came on a non aryan Christian quota. Uh, she was with the Quaker. There was a meeting. She went home. She left something there. She came back and she saw there was a registration. She jumped and said, can I register? So this is something, what did the children do themselves? Um, which I think can be found in, in the interviews. 
Um, another noteworthy piece of research would be to look at the difference between the early and the late kinder interviews, you know, whether there is a difference of our early interviews and our more recent interviews. Of course there is a difference because the people who interview now normally were younger and hence their memories are, are slightly different. And, and lastly, maybe it would be interesting to also compare interviews with kinder in the different projects because by now we have people who were interviewed for Refugee Voices, for uh, the Spielberg Arch Shaw Foundation Archive, uh, maybe for the National Holocaust, um, what do you call it? The Museum. National Holocaust Museum. Um, then maybe also in the North Nottingham, uh, Bet Shalom. So there are people who have put their interviews in different places and how the interviewer or the framework of the project uh, impacts on the narrative they present. So, Thank you for listening.